Hey there, welcome in. We've got some exciting things to talk about. The Astros of the future, the prospects, who's coming up, who will stick, and what will this future Astros lineup look like? I brought in Lindsey Crosby from Locked On MLB Prospects to talk about it. Let's get started right now. to Locked On Astros, your daily Astros podcast. Here are your hosts, Eric the Man Heisman and Brett H-Town Wheelhouse Chansey. Hey there, everybody. Welcome in to Locked On Astros. This is a special off-season edition talking Astros prospects. I'm H-Town Wheelhouse. You can find me on X, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, at H Town Wellhouse, you can find me at Stros Four One One on X Instagram and Facebook. Always positive, always Stros. You know where to find the show. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Apple, Google, Spotify. It's free and easy to listen to on any podcasting platform. Without further ado, I've got my friend Lindsey Crosby from Locked On MLB Prospects. Lindsey, thank you for coming on. Tell the folks where they can find you and maybe about some of the stuff you're writing about as well. Oh. There we go. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I am on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Uh, shows on Twitter at Locked On Farm. You can find, I actually do a bunch of written work as well, primarily covering uh, the Atlanta Braves, bravestoday.com, as well as college baseball in the SEC, primarily at auburndaily.com. So working with Sports Illustrated to cover the game of baseball, working with Locked On to talk about the game of baseball. I love it. And, you know, I'm I'm so glad to have you on because you are really, you know, we have we have Sully, who's the baseball encyclopedia. I call you the minor league baseball encyclopedia. I've got my own title for you. The In prospect episode, encyclopedia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You like that? This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get one hundred and fifty dollars in bonus bets with any winning five dollar money line bet. That's one hundred and fifty dollars if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started today. And hey, we just watched the Texans beat the Titans in the Oiler uniforms as they were trying to shame the old Oilers. And we, I think we earned the jersey back. So enough of the NFL. I just know that was a great week for us. It's the off season, but man, there's a lot of stuff going on. There, there are there are moves, there are signings, there are crazy contracts, but we're here to focus on the Astros of tomorrow, because a lot of people feel like this championship window is closing. And whether it's closing or open for another couple of years, that's not really for us to debate right now. But it really makes you wonder, what is the future? Because we hear how thin the prospect pool is. We do know the two, the two years of you know first and second round picks being stripped from the Astros has really taken effect. You really see the disservice that that's done to being able to grow the farm system with top mm-hmm. prospects. Um, of course, some trades had depleted it here and there. But, Lindsey, let's start with position players. Um, the Astros, even though they're on the bottom, they do still have some solid guys in positions. Um, who is out there that you like that's in the Astros organization right now? So – I think he's the number one prospect for a reason, but outfielder Jacob Melton gets a lot of the attention and I think deservedly so. Second rounder in 2022 out of Oregon State and I had the pleasure of watching him just absolutely rake against my Auburn Tigers in a super regional that year. That was tons of fun. Uh, But if you look at what he did last year, 23 home runs and 41 extra base hits over the course of his just under 100 games between high A and double A. And he's a guy that when you watch him, it's a little bit frustrating, right? Because it's like, it's a, just honestly, it's a weird swing. Okay. It's, it's the, in the scouting reports, they're nicer, right? They say highly unusual or unorthodox, but he's got a lot of stuff going on a big leg kick. He's kind of closed off, but it works, right? Like that it's, I am firmly of the opinion and, Everydayers who listen to Locked on MLB prospects have heard this. Like hitters are born, not made, and it's something where like it works, right? Uh, it, it it's it doesn't look right, it doesn't look normal, but he does not miss hittable pitches, and so you can't really change it. The statistical results were a little bit weird last year, right? He batted two forty five, 
with a 467 slug. And I think he can do a little bit better than that. But the power's really good for Jacob Melton. His 90th percentile exit velocity was 106. We're wow. looking for, usually on a 90th percentile exit velocity, we're looking for 101 to 102 or so to know that you have at least average power. So he's got above average power. He does a really good job when he pulls the ball. And then speed-wise, he's not an absolute burner, but he, he's got plus speed. He used, he stole 46 bags last year in 53 tries. Like, wow. despite not having absurd speed, it still works out. The question that I have is, defensively, does he play in center? Or does a better defender come along that eventually kicks him out to a corner? Because I think if he plays in center field, he's going to be fine. He's going to be average to above average defensively in center but he's just at that level of there may be somebody better than him that could make him oh. move and if he has to move he's gonna be uh he could play left or right his arm isn't really an asset but it's not a, it's not a detriment but mm. he's gonna be like a plus defender in a corner in center he's gonna be average to above average but either way like he look like he he it's a good combination of power and speed, and he feels like he could be, if everything broke right, a 2020 guy, maybe a 25-25 guy, provided he can get a little bit better with, you know, elevated fastballs, breaking issue, uh, breaking pitches on the outer half of the plate, and things like that. Okay, yeah, and and I know I know he's he's one of the guys. Um, obviously, Melton and Gilbert were were mentioned in a lot of the same conversations, and Gilbert mm -hmm. um, went away in that trade. Or Mets, yeah. Justin Verlander, and we're wondering, oh, are we going to regret that? I think he's going to be one of those, the one that got away type of players, or so it seems at this point. Um, that's if you know the, if the Mets can develop him. Now, you know, going along these lines of of guys that have been really targeted as the top guys, Zach Desenzo is another guy that we um, are hearing a lot about. A third baseman, second baseman, made it all the way up to Double A this last year. And um, he he seemed to act, actually, yeah, um, he went from Asheville to Corpus. Mm -hmm. um, and he he hit the ball really well. Um, he, hits, he hits a lot of extra base hits. Tell us about Desenzo. Yeah, he's kind of on the same timeline as Melton. They both were in high A to double A uh, around the same time. Got around the same number of games. They're probably going to debut somewhere near each other, depending on where there's an opening first. The thing with Desenzo is... The power's fantastic, right? 90th percentile exit velocity of 108. Okay, he hit, wow. what is it? He hit, a, he hit 43 extra base hits last year. Now, to go along with that, he struck out 106 times in 94 games. So, you know, a little bit higher strikeout rate than you want. But for a corner infielder, and he is a corner infielder, and I think he's probably going to end up at first base, which is fine and with this team because you need a first baseman you know, by the time he's up, it's something where you've got a little bit of issue with uh, some of the launch angles. He puts, he keeps a lot of balls on the ground. It feels like, uh, but, and, and he doesn't, he's not one of those natural hitters, right? He has to work mm. at it. The actual pure ability to make contact with the ball is probably average, like fringe to average, but he makes up for that by the fact that he does not chase, right? Like he, he does not expand the zone. You have to attack him in the strike zone to have a chance to get him out. And so it's something where he cuts down on swing and miss. He cuts down on chase and it gives him an opportunity to still be a decent bat. He batted 305 last year. And wow. for a guy who doesn't have amazing, you know, natural contact ability, to bat 300, it tells you p uh, pitchers had to come into the zone against him, and that's where his power comes into play. I do also think he's he's surprisingly fast for his size. He's like 6'4", 225 or so, but, I mean, he stole 22 of 24 bags. He's not running recklessly, but he can, he, he can steal the obvious bases. He can go first to third on a base hit, do the stuff you need him to do from a uh, from a base running perspective. It's just defensively, the arm is above average, but the actions aren't great at third base. And mm. defense does get better as you progress through the minors. You spend more time in professional baseball. 
Uh, right. Defense does get better, but from having watched him when he was in the South Atlanta League and things like that, South Atlantic League, I don't know if he's going to be able to stick at third. I think ultimately the best place for him is first base, but either way, it, he's there because of the bat and specifically the power in that bat, which is just great. Awesome. Yeah. You know, I love to hear that. And we're going to continue to, we're going to continue to talk about this. I'm going to ask you a couple more names before we get into the pitching, but first we're going to hear about FanDuel. Hey, thank y'all for tuning in to Locked on Astros. I'm Ace Wellhouse. And this is an episode brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel is America's number one sports book and it's the NFL season. And look, Texans fans or I don't care what fan you are of football. It is getting close to the playoffs, and I know you want to win some money, so let me tell you how. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any $5 winning $5 money line bet. When your team wins, you win. If you've been thinking about it, why are you waiting? There's no better time to get in the action. Let me show you why. Because if you look right now at the betting lines, the Texans are plus 116. The Browns are minus 136. The over and under is 42 and a half. So get set, get ready, and go get into the action. The app is easy to use. It's a wide range of betting options. They have available spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NFL. All right, so look, man, um, it's it's always exciting to hear guys that have potential, you know, and Desenzo, of course, I know his name's been coming up with other people's names. Well, you know, is Bregman going to sign? Is Bregman going to stay? And who's going to replace him? And, you know, are we going to sign Tucker over Bregman? And maybe we bring you on for another episode, like, like you know, what you would what you would do there. Because to me, a corner infielder is more difficult to replace than a right fielder. Mm -hmm. um, but then you look at the right fielder who Kyle Tucker is and who's going to replace that offensive production. So there's definitely a lot. Now, as, as far as position players, before we get into pitchers, there are, there are three names and, and, and you can address these in um, just a microcosm type of way. But I know Luis Baez is, has, he's got a ton of hype about him. Um, and then you have Joey Loperfito, who's my favorite guy. Um, in the minors. And then Bryce Matthews gets talked about a lot too. Can you give us a little insight into these three guys and who is, who is going to get here sooner out of these three that I just named? Ooh. Okay. Uh, the, the soonest one of those three pr feels like it's pretty easy to say low Profito simply because right. he made it to triple a last year. And yeah. when you look at the slash line, like it's, it's really good. And the thing that I noticed when you go through the top of this system is a lot of these guys were not just by default first rounders. Dezenzo was a 12th rounder. Loperfito was a seventh. Looking at this, uh, you know, Will Wagner was an 18th rounder. Like these, like Houston does a good job of taking guys who were drafted later in the draft and making them into legitimate uh, prospects. But for 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 Loperfito, the thing to me when you watch what he did: 25 homers, 55 extra base hits. Again, batted 278 last year across a couple different levels. You can see there's a lot of promising things to like, but he's not quite a complete package, okay? Mm. So when you watch, and I'm kind of throwing out that month at, at AAA. He really kind of struggled in AAA. Uh, he started pressing, he started chasing and things like that. And you see that sometimes with guys who get to AAA and they know that they're one hater away from making the bigs. They kind of press a little bit. But if you back up and look at the rest of the season, for Joey Loperfito, uh, he, he has some work to do as far as uh, ground balls, right? When you're a lefty, you don't have the shift anymore, like a, a full shift, but you do have partial right. shifts and he still hits too many ground balls. And so because of that, it kind of limits how effective his power can be, but you can see the power is there. The power potential, the home run potential is there if he can fix, fix the launch angle stuff. And he does a really good job of not being too aggressive, but not being too passive. Something that we look at, especially with younger prospects in the lower level, the minors, is when they're hesitant to swing and they walk a lot, are they walking a lot 
because they know the opposing pitcher is bad and can't throw strikes? Or are they doing a good job of balancing uh, hittable pitches? What do I swing at? What do I take? And Loperfito right. does a really good job of kind of walking that line where he's not concerned about about letting a good pitch go for a great pitch. You know, he'll 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 swing at a hittable pitch, but he'll make quality contact. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I like that. It's it's it feels like the swing still a little bit. It's kind of like Jacob Melton. There's a little bit more stuff than you'd love. It's not as crazy as Melton's, but. I like him. I think defensively, the big thing for Loperfito is his value is probably better as a super utility guy, right? Somebody like okay. a Dubon who can play center, who can play second, who can play, you know, a corner outfield, a corner infield, move around a lot of different places. And it's the issue with Loperfito is I don't think his arm is that great. And so the super utility profile works, but I don't know if you can play him on the left side of the infield. So you have Ooh. second base. And then you have center field or left field, whatever it might be. But I don't know if you can use him consistently at third. And when you look at where he played last year, he played all three outfield spots. He played first, he played second. They didn't play him any at short or third. And I think it's because of that arm. So, I mean, could he eventually be a second base replacement for Jose Altuve? Eventually, I think Jose Altuve is probably an Astro for life. So there's no worries there. But right. I do think his best value is as a super utility guy who plays all over the diamond. And, I mean, it, it reminds me a bit of, of Jacob Melton as far as the power-speed combination, maybe not as potent, maybe 15-15 or 20-20 versus the 20-20 or 20-25 that Melton might be. Okay. But I do like Loperfito. Again, I just I think that if you stick him in one position, you kind of take away some of the value that he has as a super utility guy. Right. And I've just always been impressed, especially with his background. We we had the um, opportunity of interviewing him yeah. shortly after he was drafted by the Astros and just, you know, knowing that he brought Duke their first title. I mean, there were there's a lot of things that in his background that that you can't replace other than yeah. by having that experience. So I think and the baseball instincts kind of come through on that where, you yeah. know, he's played baseball at such a high level for so long that he just understands the game. And that's why he's even able to right. go out there and play first and play second and the outfield in the same game and look competent. And I think that's one of his biggest strengths. And unfortunately that's not something that comes out in a lot of scouting reports, but that's just like that. that that's a, he's a ball player and that's not yeah. something we can quantify with a grade, but he's a ball player. So, so I want, I want to go to Luis Baez next okay. because Luis Baez to me, is a guy that I know we talked to Elvis Rodriguez and Elvis Rodriguez actually is not with the Astros anymore. He's going to be uh, coaching for the Cardinals. Now he's going to be in okay. their minor league system. And so um, I know him and Rafael Pena have exited. I think Pena went to the Phillies possibly. And so the Astros have lost a couple really big time hitting instructors from the Dominican summer league, but this guy has always talked about Luis Baez, has always talked about how good he is, how, like, the sky's the limit with him. And, and there's a lot of prospect people that mention you can't talk about Astros prospects without mentioning Luis Baez. Yeah, and and he feels like the ultimate decider on the ceiling is going to be how well he can adjust offensively to, uh, to spin and and – uh, is especially sliders off the plate. Like he, he reminds me, I'm not giving a comp. We don't do comps on my show, but uh, he reminds me of a guy like Jordan Alvarez, who you can play him in the outfield. His true best position is probably DH. I think Baez can stick longer in the outfield because his arm is so good. Like his speed is, you know, fringe at best. The defensive ability, for the most part, is fringe at best, but the arm is so good that you can keep him in the outfit a little while longer uh, simply because of that. But really, he's there because the power is very, very good. I mean, kind of just digging in some of the stats, bad, you know, hitting 27 extra base hits in like 50 games in rookie ball and A ball at his age as a 2022 international free agent, fantastic. He has the potential to be a... 30, 35 home run guy, right? Uh, the question is, and this is common a lot when you watch young, uh, young hitters, especially power hitters, you can get them with spin, specifically sliders that are down and away, breaking off the plate, things like that. So how well he adjusts to that as he moves up. And honestly, 
I want him to start in high A next year because I want him to face better pitchers that can more reliably locate breaking pitches because I want him to recognize the, uh, the, the slider off the plate and learn to lay off of that. Some guys learn it in the low minors. Some guys learn it in the high minors. Some guys learn it in MLB. I'm thinking about Austin Riley. Some guys never learn it. And I think the sooner he can learn to lay off that outside slider, make it, make them throw him something that is over the plate, on the inner third he can pull and just launch for a 500-foot home run, the better he will be and the better the Astros will be. But I like his future, uh, provided that you can make that adjustment, and that's a big adjustment to make. Yeah, but no, that is, and that's that's always a thing. And um, I don't know that we'll get to him per se, but that's always a thing with guys like Pedro Leone and and you talked about natural hitters versus, you know, like a learned hitter. Not everybody has a natural hit tool. And when, you know, I think it's funny when someone criticizes major league players are like, well, he can't hit worth, you know what? And I'm like, well, you do know how hard it is to hit the baseball. Just because you're a baseball player doesn't mean you're a great hitter. But what we'll do is um, we'll talk about one or two other position guys, and then we'll go on to the pitching here next. So you've given us an insight on Luis Baez, given us some insight on some other guys. Bryce Matthews is a, is an interesting person because, um, you know, he comes out of Nebraska, um, highly touted as a shortstop. His arrival time says 2026. So he's a little bit further out. You know, he's, he's probably maybe a little bit before Baez unless Baez breaks through. But what do you like about Bryce Matthews? He's a shortstop. You know, I know that's where Jeremy Pena is right now, mm -hmm. but is there a possibility of someone like this being talented enough to play another position or is he your, is he a shortstop and that's who he's going to be? So defensively, I think he could be above average at shortstop. The limiting factor is going to end up being his arm strength. And you can be a shortstop, a good shortstop and not have great arm strength. Dansby Swanson's a great example of that. Uh, but I ultimately think that given the fact that Jeremy Pena is so good at shortstop and is kind of entrenched, you're looking at a, a, at a scenario where he can't kick out to third because of that arm. So he either would kick into second where Jose Altuve is, or I do think, and there's a couple scouts that I've talked to that also agree with this, that he could play center field. Uh, you know, six foot, 175, good, uh, good speed. I'd say it's above average speed. And so the ground he covers... Uh, and then you can kind of mitigate the the arm only being fringe to average in the outfield. Uh, another thing where power is probably above average, the hit tool, another not a natural hitter. Uh, it, he makes it work because he's very, very selective, kind of like uh, Zach DeZenzo doesn't chase a lot. You have to attack him in the zone. Now, if it's in the zone, he's going to swing. He will swing at right. just about everything that's over the plate, but it has to be over the plate to get him to swing, and that's the differentiating factor. So uh, if you throw him a pitch on the inner third, you are screwed. He is going to hit that for a home run. He's really good at pulling that 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 fastball in for a home run. Um, again, I think he could stick it short because Jeremy Pena is there. He's not going to supplant Pena. He would have to kick inside, and if Altuve is still there, they're going to look at him having to kick out to center field, which might work out in the end. But I do think that power-wise, I mean, 15-15-20-20, not out of the realm of possibility for Bryce Matthews. He actually had the first 2020 season in Nebraska history, which was kind of cool. Yeah, I saw that. And, um, you know, just, just a little factoid about Bryce Matthews is he was an All-State quarterback. And in his senior year in high school, he threw for 54 touchdowns. So... <laughs> You know, that that having that arm there, having that football background mm -hmm. might might help a little bit. But, you know, the scouting report for for the Astros website is exactly what you said it was. Uh, you and, know, um, he has a permit. He, he he's 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 kind of prone to swing and miss, but he's swinging at, you know, stuff over the plate. Um, and also his defense and arm are, you know, kind of average. But I have a question about arm strength. Is okay. arm strength something? you can gain or do you either have it like a Carlos Correa or you don't, you know what I'm saying? What is that something that these players can develop? Because I don't know if all our people watching know these things. 
So I would say if you're looking at a prospect, there's two ways that you can improve your arm strength. And one is if you're looking at a prep prospect, as they gain natural strength, as they go through those, you know, age 19 through 21 years, they're going right. to get na a naturally stronger arm as they gain strength. But then two, you can do biomechanical work to kind of uh, get the most efficiency out of your existing movements. And I think about uh, not everybody's fan here in Houston, but like Anthony Volpe of the Texas, of the New York Yankees. He's a guy right. who doesn't have an amazing arm. I'd call it similar to Bryce Matthews, but he went to a biomechanical lab and got more efficient with his arm movement to get to the point where his arm was not a detriment at shortstop. So oh, okay. you could you could probably bump it a half grade by just getting more efficient with your movements. So a 45 to a 50, uh, a 40 to a 45. I think for Matthews, he could get it to the point where he'd probably be average with arm strength, but it I, it's hard to go past that for a guy who's already 22, 23 years old. So a half, right. a half grade's reasonable. So, so with all these things, with these position players, with these pitchers and all mm -hmm. this stuff going on, and we don't know who they're going to resign and all that stuff, what do you think the system outlook is for this Houston Astros team? Do you think that we are just going to have to let Dana Brown cook and <laughs> we're going to have to let him do his thing because it's going to take a couple years? Or do we think we see some things come to fruition like we have with some budding stars like a Garcia or Javier, guys like that? So having watched Dana Brown in Atlanta, I'm going to say let Dana Brown cook. What Dana Brown is very good at doing, one, you already touched on it, very good at getting those dual sport athletes, right? Like something you saw a lot of Atlanta's drafts had dual sport athletes, very good at getting the athletic guys and then finding ways to lean into the organization's strengths. And I'm going to point out that you guys mm. have had a re done a really good job of developing international pitchers and getting them to the majors, a Valdez, a Javier, things like that. And so expect Dana Brown to spend the next couple years leaning into what the organization does well and getting you the assets where if you don't have a prospect to promote into an open spot, you have the prospect capital to make a trade to get a guy to put into the open spot. So okay. uh, I feel really good about Dana Brown be running the Astros simply because I felt really good about Dana Brown uh, being in charge of a lot of the scouting and the drafting with the Atlanta Braves uh, and, and just seeing how that paid off for them. Um, I I will say when you look at the pitching, I do think there needs to be a little bit more of an investment in pitching in the organization. You've got a couple pitchers in the top 10. Uh, Spencer Arigetti is the guy that, uh, that, that folks always seem to talk about. I like Alonzo Treadwell better than Spencer Arigetti simply because of the ceilings of each one of the guys. But I do trust Dana Brown to invest more in the arms because it's harder and you need more pitchers than you need necessarily bench pieces or backup position players. So mm. be, be on the lookout for that. I feel like some of the upcoming drafts are going to be weighted a little heavier towards pitching than they have been in the past simply to kind of restock the system and give you the arms you need to get through a full season. You saw what happened with Hunter Brown last year when he had yeah. the biggest workload of his entire life. And uh, the the couldn't necessarily keep sustain it for an entire season. So uh, be on the lookout for that. But I feel good about the future of this system, even if right now it's not the deepest system in the world. I feel good about Dana Brown's ability to go out and get guys that y'all can maximize and make into quality major leaguers or trade pieces. You know, that's all great conversation, and I love it. But you know what? We come to the end of the show, and Lindsay, it's always great having you on. Make sure y'all follow him at Crosby Baseball. Go to Locked on MLB Prospects. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. Listen to him. The draft coming up this year, he's your guy. I'm H Town Wheelhouse. He's Lindsay Crosby. We are your local experts for all things Astros and all things prospects. And remember, we are your team every single day. Go Strohs. Thank you, Lindsay. You have a good one. Thanks.